so the way that um, we're going to go about today is that I have a few slides to finish, to finish up the test one material. Um, then I will describe where I'm at with test one, like what's the format and all that good stuff. And then I'll open the floor for any questions about test one, the material or anything that you have. So we got about half an hour or stuff to go. Um, so let's get to it. And just a reminder from what we were talking about Tuesday, we ended on this uh, slide that contains a lot of information. Um, and this is how we can regulate uh, glycogen synthesis and breakdown in muscles. Um, and one of the big proteins that was um, involved in that is PP1, phosphoprotein inhibitor 1-alpha. Um, as you can see here down on this slide, uh, when PP1 is active, it will turn on glycogen synthase and it will turn off glycogen phosphorylase and turn off phosphorylase kinase B. And I'm bringing that up because we're going to talk about PP1 a little bit more now, <clears throat> but in the liver. So both liver and muscle cells, they're the big storage for glycogen in the body, but they use slightly different systems to handle um, when glycogen can be broke down and when it can be re released. So let me just copy what's written down here that's been cut off, phosphorylase B, phosphorylase A, and remember this is breakdown of glycogen. All right, so the, the uh, subunit that binds glycogen in the liver is called GL. And in muscles, it was called GM. And the big difference between GM and GL and PP1 itself is that this system isn't regulated through phosphorylation. If you remember when we looked at the GM systems, how we regulate PP1 in muscles, it had to do with phosphorylating our GM subunit. Liver doesn't have that system. Instead, what happens is that PP1, remember, and just so we're all aware, here's PP1 again, and here on this graph in the top right is what PP1 is affecting. PP1 actually binds to phosphorylase A. So that's what's happening in the muscle. So we have phosphorylase A and PP1 is bound to it, right? And both the R and the T states of phosphorylase A bind PP1. R state binds it really tight. So if you're in the R state of phosphorylase alpha, you are gonna go and take all PP1 from the cell, which makes sense. Makes a lot of sense that um, this system works this way. Because remember when PP1 is active, we are turning on glycogen synthesis. However, Phosphorylase A. Phosphorylase A's whole goal is to break down glycogen. So if we're in the state where we want to break down glycogen, it makes sense that we don't want to do the reverse process of making glycogen at the same time. So the enzyme responsible for breaking down glycogen will also take away the enzyme that is responsible for starting the synthesis process. However, when we get to the state 
that the cell has a lot of glucose, the R form of phosphorylase A switches to the T form. When you're in the T form, since you already have PP1 bound, what PP1 does, it's already right there to do it, it removes the phosphates. And it's actually shown right here. Here's PP1. It will remove the phosphates, converting our phosphorylase A to the B form. Once in the B form, phosphorylase lets go of PP1. So now PP1 is free to roam in the cell and it can go and turn off phosphorylase kinase now. And this usually happens when 90% of your phosphorylase are in the B form as well. Again, this is a, another genius system. If a lot of glucose is around, there's no reason to break down glycogen. Therefore, once we turn off glycogen uh, breakdown by switching phosphorylase A to B, release PP1. Once PP1 is released, one of the main things it's gonna do is go and turn off phosphorylase kinase. It's gonna remove the phosphate from phosphorylase kinase, switching it off so we cannot go back to the alpha form of our phosphorylase. So it's like a safety mechanism to make sure this system is turned off. And this is really in the liver, it's controlled by how much glucose is available. So your liver is always sensing in your blood how much glucose is, is circulating. Based on that concentration, it can decide, should I store glycogen or should I make glycogen rather? Or should I break down glycogen to release glucose? And it's all controlled with this system um, that I just explained. So it's the G subunit that's going from T to R and vice versa. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by G subunit. It's the T to R is the whole protein phosphorylase. That's what's switching from T to R. But phosphorylase also has two forms, A and B. Um, so the way to think about it is that the phosphorylase enzyme, I think I mentioned this before, but I'll go over it again. The phosphorylase enzyme has four forms, the beta form and the R, R form, or the beta form and the T form. If you're, in, if you're the beta version of your enzyme, you're gonna be in the T form for the most part. You also have the alpha form or the A form in T, A form in R. If you're in the alpha form, you're gonna to wanna to be in R. You just favor R. So just merely think of this of different, different levels are, are different states the same enzyme can be in. All right, any other questions about this system? All right, we can uh, move on then. So through this, we have seen that like different, like single molecules can have like a giant effect. And all, all of these types of control strategies, um, there's just different layers to that. And what is the advantage to a cell having a control system like we've been talking about and for me, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and, and answer this. The idea here is that 
one, one molecule can have a cascading effect. So if we go back to the idea of cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP is the major, um, major uh, uh, molecule in the cell that says we're low energy. And the cell is really good at sensing CAMP levels. And I don't know, the numbers I'm about to say are made up, but the idea is correct. So let's, let's say under normal conditions, you have five millimolar of cyclic AMP. Your body, your cells are so good that in the low energy state, it only takes a, roughly a 10% increase of CAMP to be in the low energy state. So the amount of CAMP is closely watched and about a 10% increase will tell your cells you're low energy. So what will happen now is that, let's say for example, this level of CAMP can go and interact with three different protein kinase A molecules. And the, when I say three, um, I, I'm just making up that number to show an example of the point I'm getting to. All right, so a 10% increase in CAMP leads to the activation of three molecules of PKA. Let's just say for argument's sake, those three molecules of PKA each turn on three molecules of phosphorylase kinase. And I'm just kinase, and I'm just going to do PK for the rest. So those three molecules turn on nine molecules of PK. And then each one of these molecules of phosphorylase kinase turns on three molecules of glycogen phosphorylase. And I'm just going to do GPA. And for the rest, I'm just going to draw arrows because I think you get the point. So from just a small increase in PKA by having a system like this, we turn on three, six, or sorry, three, six, nine, 12, a lot. I'm going to stop counting because it, it's a lot. The idea of this is to start like a cascade. It's like almost like dominoes where having these different layers, one allows you to have a little bit of a signal, only, only a 10% increase in CAMP have a large scale impact because every single layer, you're like multiplying that effect. You're making, making the announcement louder by having uh, these different molecules go off and activate different things. This also allows for greater control, right? Because not only does the level of CAMP have to increase, but PPI also has to be off too. Because if PPI is on, it's just gonna reverse what the increase of cyclic AMP is. So it's allowing you to have this fine layer control, but most importantly, it's allowing you to amplify a system by having just a little bit of change at the front end. And this is generally how hormones in your cells work, right? So we're gonna look at this in just a, uh, a slide or two, but when you release a hormone into your bloodstream, you don't have to like release a lot of it because what happens is that your cell will bind a couple molecules and then a chain reaction will happen where you bind that molecule, you release a thousand molecules inside the cell. Those thousand molecules go and interact with a thousand proteins that turn on 10,000 other proteins or something like that. It's a way to amplify our signal. All right, so did that explanation make sense or uh, any questions about the logic of these types of systems?
All right. If not, I'll go on to the next slide. Right. Well, I do have a question. Small change equals large result. Basically, yeah. We, if you have a system set up like we've been going off, you can have a small change equal a big result. Why is it critical that the activity PP1 itself is regulated? Um, because um, you don't want a fetal cycle, right? If you're in the case we just talked about with CAMP is released, if you couldn't regulate PP1, you would have both the breakdown of glycogen and the synthesis of glycogen happening at the same time. It would be a fetal cycle. You're wasting energy doing nothing. So that's why PP1 has to be regulated. Um, it's a big control point for uh, if you're breaking down glycogen or synthesizing glycogen. All right, so just a couple more slides to go on, and this is glucagon. So we're gonna briefly talk about hormone control of uh, uh, glycolysis and glycogen breakdown now. And the metabolism of glycogen uh, mainly happens in your liver. That's where a lot of your glycogen is. And it's usually controlled by two hormones. There's others that we'll look at, but two main ones being insulin and glucagon. All right, easy to remember what these do because glucagon has a great name. Um, glucagon, glucose is gone. Glucagon is releasing your bloodstream when glucose is gone. So it's saying you're in a low energy state. Insulin, I'm sure everybody's heard a lot about insulin um, up to this point of their lives. Um, insulin is what you release after you ate. So that's, that's more like a high energy state. And glucagon is you're in a low energy state. This is all, all controlled by the pancreas, by how much glucose is available. And your muscles and other tissues, they respond to blood glucose by either insulin, epinephrine, or norepinephrine. So those tissues really can't, they don't know how much glucose is in the blood. They rely on the pancreas to do that for them. And then they read the signal that's given off by the pancreas. Um, and they can do things like we've just talked about on Tuesday and today by uh, phosphorylating different enzymes. And they can also release molecules into the cell to start those phosphorylation chains, like that CAMP, uh, cyclic AMP we were talking about. This is all controlled by hormones. So we're going to go over these hormones and this, uh, these series of slides are going to be the last ones for uh, test one. So when you are low blood glucose, less than five millimolar, so after you have exercised or it's been many hours since you last digested food, uh, your blood glucose will drop and your pancreas will release glucagon. What glucagon does is that it will go and interact with the liver. So your liver cells have these glucagon receptors. Once glucagon binds on the outside, cyclic AMP is released on the inside of the cell. And we just saw what cyclic AMP does uh, just a few slides ago and at the end of Tuesday, it's going to ramp up glycogen uh, degradation. Once that, once you start breaking down glycogen in the liver, you're going to export that. So GLUT2, and that's glucose leaving out there. Because remember, the liver is the main storage in your body for gly glycogen. So the way your body, uh, well, mainly your brain and your muscles, stays fed during, after exercise and during uh, like fast is that your liver is supplying glucose. So your, your glucose leaves the liver, it can go to the other tissues it needs to go to. Muscle cells, they actually don't have receptors for glucagon. 
So they are blind to glucagon themselves. They can't actually tell when you're in this low glucose state, but it doesn't matter because the liver is releasing uh, glucose. And it's actually very good that the muscles don't see glucagon. Because remember, the muscles, their weight only like 1% to 2% glycogen, and the liver is like 25% weight of glycogen. And your glycogen in your muscle is only there for when you're like using your muscles, right? It's a very fast energy source when you are doing maximum effort. So if they responded to glucagon, you would waste that, you waste that power. And let's say, I don't know, let's say you were uh, sitting in a forest and it's been like eight hours since you last ate. And let's say your muscles for some reason uh, could read glucagon. And so your muscles would take that glucagon signal and say, oh, we're hungry, start breaking down our glycogen storage. And then once that happens, oh no, a bear's coming. I better run away. And then you run for like two seconds and all your muscles are like, okay, I'm tired. I have no energy now. And then you're dead because the bear eats you and you don't pass on those crappy muscle genes. So it's very good that muscles don't see these glucagon molecules, but they do get fed because the liver is sending out glucose throughout the body. Another um, hormone that everybody's going to be feeling, I'm sure, this weekend and then the lead up to Tuesday is epinephrine. That's the fight or flight uh, response that happens during stress. So when you're feeling all nervous, your, your adrenal glands are flooding your system with this. And epinephrine can be um, seen by the muscles and the liver because when that's released, it means you are, you're going to have to move now. You, you need to get out, of, get out of Dodge right now. And so what that does is both in the muscle and in the liver, you have beta receptors for epinephrine and you release cyclic AMP in the muscle and the liver. Your um, liver cells actually have two receptors for this, a beta receptor and an alpha receptor. The alpha receptor releases ca uh, 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 calcium as well as cyclic AMP. And the idea of this is that uh, calcium speeds up this process. It reinforces this process. So you are breaking down a glycogen much faster with calcium around. So again, the same idea here. If you have epinephrine floating around, uh, you are getting ready to mobilize. So you're flooding your bloodstream with glucose via your liver and your muscles are um, breaking down glycogen so they can have that emergency storage already ready to go um, because you are sending the signal that you need it. Um, also why when you get stressful, you might start like shaking because you have all this ATP just building up in your muscles ready to go. And I believe, yeah, the last hormone is insulin uh, from your pancreas as well. After you eat, you release insulin. Um, both your muscle and liver have these insulin receptors. Um, in the liver, what they do is they simply um, uh, turn on glycogen synthesis. So once the liver uh, receives the message that insulin's around, it will start to build glycogen. For your muscles, insulin does two things. One, it starts on glycogen synthesis as well, but it also uh, turns on and increases the production of GLUT4. So GLUT4 is glucose transporter. That's what GLUT means, glucose transporter. Um, your liver does not have GLUT4, so they can't do this, but your muscles do. And GLUT4 allows more glucose to go into your muscles, All right? So we just ate, so flood your muscles with this glucose so we can start building up our emergency glycogen um, storages.
Yeah, so this is found in muscle and fat cells, unfortunately not your liver and your brain. Uh, when this happens, cyclic AMP uh, decreases and you no longer break down glycogen, which makes sense. Uh, insulin can go and interact with PP1. And we did see this when we were talking about PP1 regulation in the muscle, how insulin affects that as well. So that's our hormone control. Glucagon, epinephrine lead to the breakdown of glycogen. Insulin leads to the storage of glucose and glycogen. So any questions about the hormonal control system of glycogen? All right. So just some uh, quick questions here. And so I'll answer these so we can get on to um, any review questions people might have. Um, but why does it make sense for the hormone to uh, stimulate uh, glucogenolysis and inhibit glycolysis in the liver while stimulating both glycogenolysis and glycolysis in the muscle? So I'm saying, why does it make sense that we break down glycogen here, but don't do glycolysis while we do break down glycogen and do glycolysis here? So like we're talking about epinephrine at this point, why does it make sense that this happens? And that's because epinephrine, like I said, is that fight or flight. So when that's um, being released, that means that um, you're in some kind of panic mode and your body will need to move very fast. So we want to release that energy, that glucose in your liver, but your glucose isn't gonna make your body move. And or sorry, your liver is not gonna make your body move, right? So liver, you don't need this energy. I don't want you to use this for glycolysis. All I want you to do is break down glycogen and transport it into the bloodstream. But in the muscle, the muscle does need energy. So please, uh, sorry, that should not be synthesis. Oh, that, that check marks, all right. It should be breakdown. Yeah, there it is, it's already written put my check mark in the wrong place. But in the muscle, we do want to break down this uh, glucose and use it for energy. So that's why the epinephrine um, has these two different effects in the muscle and the liver and why it makes sense when you think about what that hormone is trying to signal to the body. So questions about that idea? And our last question. So many diabetics do not respond to insulin because they have a deficiency in insulin receptors on their cell. They, they just can't see it. So how does this affect the level of circulating glucose immediately after a meal and the rate of glycogen synthesis in the muscle? All right. So this question is asking, if you don't have these, What's the consequence? Well, after a meal, the amount of glucose in your blood stays high. Because your cells aren't getting the signal that glucose is available, right? Because insulin is what is tr delivering that message. And if you don't have receptors, your cells don't get that signal. So the glucose doesn't go anywhere in your bloodstream. And what that means is that you have lower amount of glycogen synthesis in your muscles because um, your, your, your muscles don't know glucose is available. So it will break down glycogen instead. It'll break down your storage because your muscles think, oh, we haven't been eating for a long time. 
I need glucose, let's start breaking down our emergency storage. So that is one way um, diabetes, uh, one type of diabetes can affect uh, people at the cellular level because they can't see the signal. And now we kind of know the biochemistry of what that effect is. And we'll learn later in this class, like how your body compensates for that, um, how it does get energy when it can't see insulin also known as ketosis or the keto diet. Yay. Anyways, that is all the material for test one up to that point. So some things to say about test one, then I'll open, open the floor for any questions anybody might have. Um, so I have made most of the tests this morning, not all of it, but a lot. And the way it's going to come out is that you are going to be seeing a lot more multiple choice um, than normal, like compared to if those of you who took Biochem 1 in the fall, um, you're going to see a lot more multiple choice for, uh, for this test, test 1. Um, that also means we'll be looking at more questions. So I'm going to say that test one is going to fall between the 40 to 50 question mark or questions, like the number of questions. And I would say, let's just say there's 50 of them. I would say roughly 40 of them would be multiple choice. You will have a couple short answers thrown in there. And you will have a couple of calculations, like the calculations we did uh, in class, like the delta G calculations, the delta E calculations. That being said, um, I will put up an equation sheet that you are free to download in half. Um, I will put any constants you need, um, and I'll put a table of reduction potentials if you need it um, for, for the test. The test will be online through Blackboard, course content, and I set this on Tuesday, but I'll repeat it. Uh, it will open this Tuesday, starting at 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. Um, you can start it whenever. You have 75 minutes, but once you start, um, the timer's going. So even if you close out of it, uh, the timer will be counting. Um, I will have it so you can see the test all at once. So not question by question, but you'll have all the questions up at the same time. But the questions will likely be um, a switch for different people. So I'll have it so like your question number one is not the same question number one that anyone else is probably going to see. I'm just going to scramble those for everybody. I will also be using Proctor U. I know I everybody is not a fan of it, and I don't like it either. But it is a good way to allow me to have flexibility with the test hours and to make sure that the person who actually signed up for the class is, is taking the test because I know that has happened before, not in my class, but in just in general. Um, and I'll say this as well, don't worry if on your screen it flashes um, like cheating has been notified and your university will be, will be contacted. What that means is I get an email that shows me um, the timestamp of when it happened and then I just had to review it. Um, last semester, um, every single timestamp they sent me wasn't actually an issue in this class. Gen Chem 1, there was some actual real issues, but for Biochem 1, um, nobody had like a real issue. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing that. You have an equation sheet. You should have a calculator. Um, and you can have pieces of paper to, to write on.
I'm not going to have you draw anything because that's I don't know how to do that in in Blackboard and it wouldn't be fair to people anyways trying to draw with a mouse. Um, but yeah, I think that's the general things that I can think of off the top of my head. So do, does anyone have any specific questions about the test itself or anything about the material they want me to go over again? Can you please show us how you solve question one on the redox practice problems? So let me open up the redox practice problems. And then we have another question it's about question six on this PowerPoint. Um, so let me let me do the redox font one, then I'll get the question two on this PowerPoint. Redox practice problems. Let me get the chat back out. Okay, what was it? Uh, question one. And yes, let me let me stop sharing. Let me do, see if I can share this. Enable editing, please. From current slide. So what is delta G not prime for the spontaneous reaction of oxygen going to H2O2 and FAD going to FADH2? Okay. So for the first problem, you have to realize, well, the first thing you have to do is that you have to know which reaction is being oxidized and which one is being reduced. And if I say spontaneous problem and I give you a question like this, remember um, the, the molecules at the top, the more positive you are, the more you want to be reduced. The more negative you are, the more you want to be oxidized. So here, yeah, so I have oxygen going to hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so that is right here. That has a score of 0.295. FAD has a score of negative 219. So the way this works out is that it's oxygen um, plus FADH2 goes to H2O2 plus FAD. So the first thing you have to do is just have to figure out which way each, each reaction goes. So this one is unchanged. Now I have to flip this one. Because remember, we always write our equations as reductions. However, in a redox reaction, they're not both reductions. One is reduced and one is oxidized. And I'm also going to get the answer key up here because I don't want to redo all my math because I'm lazy like that. So once we do that, we can calculate delta E. And delta E is what's being reduced minus what's being oxidized. So here, delta E is 0.295. So that's oxygen minus, well, minus 0.219. So it's two minus signs because FAD is negative to begin with. And so that is uh, 0.335. That's what I have written down the answer key. And that is not 0.335. I don't know what I got the 0.04. Oh, 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 I know, I see. 
Why does FAD get flipped when it's going the right way? Yeah, uh, let me get back to that one second. So those of you following at home on the answer key, it seems on the answer key, I actually picked this FAD instead of the other FAD. Um, and in reality, um, they are two different things. And I think looking at when I'm doing this question now, I should pick the negative 0.2191 because I never said FADH is in an enzyme, but it doesn't matter um, on, if, on a test, since I already written the test and you have a problem like this, um, I'm gonna say you won't run into this because I was very specific in which one in, in which, which substances you wanna use. So I'm gonna follow the test or, or the answer key and it should be 0 0.040. And that will give us our positive value of uh, 0.335. All right, so going back to the question, how do I know which one to flip? Well, you have to figure out if I'm gonna com combine these two equations, right? I need to figure out which way electrons are going to flow, right? The way that these half equations are written, they're always written as reduction potentials. No matter what, when I have half reactions, 100% of the time, I'm going to write that as a reduction reaction. However, let, let's say I didn't flip these. What would be my overall reaction? My overall reaction is oxygen plus four hydrogens plus four electrons plus FAD goes to H2O2 plus FADH2, which is not a redox reaction. Remember, a redox reaction is a transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. Here, I just have four electrons hanging out on one side of the equation. So whenever you do a redox reaction, redox reaction, you always start with a with reduction potentials. And you have to flip one of them. You always have to, and then combine them. Because if you don't flip one of those, it's not a redox reaction anymore. So the question is, what am I flipping? Am I flipping oxygen or am I flipping FAD? And you always flip whatever comes lower on the chart. Because flipping it means that you're oxidized, right? So when I flip an equation, I'm writing the oxidized form of the equation. I'm saying, well, FADH2 goes to FAD plus 2H plus two electrons. So this form, we're losing electrons. Here, we're gaining electrons. I now have, and I combine them together, I have a redox reaction, right? So that's why you're flipping, and that's how you decide which one to flip. And, and try not to get like confused when looking at this table and saying they're already in redox, like they're in the right orientation. Remember, this orientation is just reduction. And that's just done for historical reasons. There's no reason why this couldn't be an oxidation table. And all that would happen is that all these numbers signs would change. So does that make sense why, why I flipped something there and why I picked what to flip? Okay, so we calculate delta E. Once we have delta E, we can throw that into our next equation, delta G equals minus NF delta E. Like I said, you'll have this equation on, on uh, the equation sheet. Delta G not prime equals minus NF delta E not prime. N, number of electrons, two. Most common mistake I see there is people add them. 
Remember, what we're saying is that two electrons are going from FADH2 to O2. So even though these are half reactions, remember, we're combining them into one reaction. And when we do that, since we flip the second equation, the electrons cancel out. So more of the story is when figuring out N, just, just read what's on there. Don't, don't do any addition or multiplication. Faraday's is constant, 96485 multiplied by 0.335, negative, and that's how you get delta G. Uh, delta G not prime, which if I trust my math was 64.6 kilojoules. So that's the first part of that problem. Um, so the second part is what is delta G if the ratio of H2O2 to O2 is 100 and FADH2 to FAD is 1 to 50? Okay. So for this, we need a separate equation and we need that delta G equals delta G not prime plus RT ln products over reactants. And the answer key, I use delta E, um, which you can do, that just takes an extra step. And I'm not sure why I did that in retrospect. So I'm just going to show you the faster way. Yeah. So delta G not prime. We just solved it. 64.6 plus R. Uh, R is a constant. 8.314 times 10 to the minus 3 kilojoules per mole. No, I'm running out of space. This was a poor place to put it. Times T, uh, 298. So products over reactants. Well, our products are H2O2 and FAD. And our reactants were O2 and FADH2. And I'm just getting that from this equation to know which order is which. And so I need a ratio. So for every 100 molecules of H2O2, I have one molecule of O2. That's what the ratio of 100 means. And for every one molecule of FADH2, I have 50 molecules of FAD. That's what one to 50 means. So just plug that in. So H2O2, that is H2O2 and FAD are on the top. So H2O2, we said was 100. Uh, FAD, we said it's 50. So that's 5,000 divided by, and everything else is one. So you're taking the natural log of 5,000, multiplied by RT plus delta G not prime to get delta G. All right, now that you've heard the explanation, does that make a little more sense or uh, were you confused at a, uh, by something I did there? Okay, let's go on to question six from the PowerPoint we're on today then. Question six, and let me reread your question. So glycogen degradation and glycolysis happen in the muscle cell, but in the liver cell, it's the opposite. Um, it's not quite the opposite. What's happening? Uh, what I was saying there is that you break down glycogen in the liver, but you don't do glycolysis. In the muscles, you break down glycogen and you also do glycolysis. 
So the question is really saying, why does it make sense to break down glycogen in both places? That's what glycogenolysis is. Remember, lysis means break down, break down the glycogen. So why does it make sense to do that, but not glycolysis in the liver while doing it in the muscle? And, and the idea is um, when epinephrine's around, we are trying to mobilize energy to get ready for movement or for fighting, movement in some way. So the majority of glucose that we're freeing up is going to be from the liver because the liver is our major glucose storage. It has the majority of the glycogen in your body. So if, if we didn't turn off glycolysis in the liver, what would happen is that a lot of the glycogen that you, or a lot of the glucose you free up from glycogen would be used in the liver for glycolysis, which would waste all that energy. So instead we say we stop glycolysis in the liver, let the glucose leave the liver and go to the muscle cells where in the muscle cells, it can be broken down for energy via glycolysis. And we need that energy to move. So that's what question six was saying. That explanation makes sense. Okay. Um, anyone have any other questions about anything concerning test one? Ask me anything you want. What steps in glycolysis should we know the mechanisms for? So let me pop open the glycolysis um, uh, PowerPoint. What's that PowerPoint for? Was it this one? No, it's the one before this. So that is problem set three. So it's mainly the ones that we went over. Um, I will say that for our... Um, since I'm already like past this part in making the exam, I know how I'm going to ask these questions. And sorry, I'm just trying to think of how to phrase it without telling you what the question is. So one thing that won't happen is that I, I will not ask you to describe what's happening step by step in that I won't say, describe what happens in the phosphoglucose isomerase reaction step by step. What I could ask you though, is what type of catalysis is being used for this enzyme? And the ones we went over were like phosphoglucose isomerase um, and anything where we went over mechanism aldolase, um, triose phosphate isomerase. Don't really have a mechanism there, there. Uh, pyruvate kinase has a little bit of a mechanism. So I might ask you what type of catalysis is happening. Um, I might show you an intermediate and say of the enzymes that we looked at, what enzyme produces this intermediate or I might ask what cofactors are important. So for like a pyruvate kinase, that would be magnesium. Um, any anytime you see like here for a GAPDH, uh, NAD is important. So I would say that 
uh, quick answer to your question. Any anytime you see steps like this in our PowerPoints, um, I'm free to ask questions concerning those steps. I'm not going to ask you to just list what's happening step by step because really for those I like to see people draw out mechanisms and this this year I, I can't. Um, but I will be asking what type of catalysis. Um, and along those lines, basically what I would say in general it comes to glycolysis, if you can repeat this, this information, like if, if I gave you a blank piece of paper and I said, write all this down, please, and you could, uh, I don't know, you, you would be set, pr pretty set on glycolysis. Um, there are other questions I'll ask that's not rote memorization, um, but that, that's a good start. So if the question was about the reaction pyruvate kinase, the answer would be phosphorylation. Um, so like, like questions you could see with, for glycolysis is, you know, what, what steps produce ATP? What steps use ATP? What steps you, uh, make NADH? Also, um, like I'll, I will give you, and I already made questions like these. I will give you a picture of one of one of uh, the steps of glycolysis, one of the sugars in there, and I'll say what comes next. Or I can give you the name of an enzyme and says what does this make, and then give you like a bunch of pictures. All right. So that's that's kind of how we're framing like the whole just the just the checking of do you have do you know the steps of glycolysis? And, and that's also fair game for the other sugars we talked about. So um, galactose, mannose, and fructose. I will probably do something similar. I haven't gotten to those yet. In the phosphate pyruvate, or uh, sorry, the, the uh, phosphate shunt, uh, you might get like, here's a picture of one of the things in there. And then the multi, and it will be multiple choice for this, but here's five other pictures of sugars, which is the correct next step in this pathway. Or this enzyme, I'll give you an enzyme name and I'll say, what is the reaction that this catalyzes? Or I could do the reverse, right? I'll give you a reaction. I'll say, what is, what enzyme will, will, will make this for us? Um, and for the enzyme names, um, somebody asked me a question a couple of weeks ago, if we need to know the full name or just like the PFK, uh, PGI. Um, so what I would do is I, I will put both names for enzymes. I'll be like hexokinase, HK in the answer or when I talk about it. Which pathways? Um, all the pathways we talked about up to this point. So glycolysis, um, then the fates of pyruvate, when you don't have oxygen around, uh, the phosphate, uh, the pentose phosphate shunt. Um, how galactose turns into glucose, how mannose turns into galact, how mannose turns into glucose, how fructose turns into glucose, and the pathway of turning on and turning off glycogen that we spent the last couple of days on. Basically, if I spent time on it during our sessions, I'm going to ask you some question about it. That's the short answer. Like a question like this, um, no, is a that's a good example of a question that I might ask, like for glycolysis, which reactions make ATP and ADH, and which ones can't go in reverse, right? Like, so make sure you go back over these when you're going back over these, make sure you can answer those questions because um, they're, they're kind of a good indication of the type of stuff you will see. How to differentiate between an isomerase 
and a mutase? Um, that's a really good question. Um, for uh, mutase, usually what we see for mutases is that um, like our chiral center doesn't change and we're just uh, moving moving a, a group around. So let me let me get that like for here. The carbons, carbon two and three are chiral, but we're not really changing that. And we're just moving a mutase, or sorry, this phosphate around. I think the isomerases um, will have more of a, like, I'm gonna switch, kind of get a picture of that. I'm gonna switch the chiral center. Uh, Phosphoglucose uh, isomerase. So am I a giant liar in that? Um, so for the isomerase, yeah. So the isomerase, we're not like moving any functional group. That's also the big thing. The, the big thing about a mutase is that you are moving like a functional group. While for here in the isomerase, we're changing how things are bonded, but we're not moving groups. Um, and that's why I was talking about chirality. A lot of times with mutate or isomerases, you'll just switch like a chiral, like especially for sugars, if like an OH is on the right, an isomerase could go on and just say, I'm gonna switch this OH on the left when you're looking at the Fisher projection, where you're not moving, like you're not moving that OH to a different carbon, you're just changing its orientation. Here in fossil glucose isomerase, like I said, we're not moving functional groups. We're just changing bond orders a little bit. So that's how I would differentiate the two. And I'm sure you can find examples that just contradict what I said. Um, but in general, that that's what I would say is the difference between a mutase and isomerase. So one's a reconfiguration and the other is a transfer. Basically, yeah. Basically, I saw, because if you break down what an uh, isomer is, right? That's what isomerase is doing. It's doing isomer, uh, making a different isomer like of that sugar or of that molecule. While mutase is mutating that into something different but just moving like around a functional group. I, that's, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's why it's called an isomerase. And if I had to guess, that's why people started call, calling it a mutase. Because before you could actually look at these molecules, you would see that the molecule would have like quite different properties because you're moving the functional group. And, you, and when you're doing measurements, uh, you should be able to see that. That's what I would guess anyways. I've never ever actually looked up the historical um, reason why the word mutase was chosen. What else? What else do people want to know? And I do have, I did put up the answer key for test one from uh, last year, if you haven't seen that, by the way. Um, and test one is an excellent way to test your, your uh, understanding because um, the amount of material we covered last year is the same amount of material we covered for this year. So unlike in biochemistry where the tests, you know, where you would see some stuff on test one that maybe we didn't get to. This semester is not the case. We we're actually at the same exact point. So everything you see on test one from last year covers all the material we see this year. That being said, you might see material I didn't ask on test one last year appear this year. Um, yeah. But it, it, I would definitely just see 
go and test yourself out because it covers the same major concepts. What else? What are other questions that you might have? I'll go seven, pull five forward. Yeah, so like in biochemistry one, if I said like a word 30 times during the course of the semester, I'm probably gonna ask you to describe what I was talking about. Coupling. Yeah, you can expect a question that deals with coupling. But those those are the type of questions where like, if you've been paying attention, they should be like a layup for you. I like to put in questions where if you are listening to me, you, you it like takes no thought or it shouldn't take any thought. If you aren't listening, then you get punished for missing the easy ones. Large negative delta G, again, it's, yeah, so we make sure you understand that concept of uh, phosphates, what makes phosphates high energy, because we have been talking about phosphates a lot. So if there's no like questions, what I'll do is I'm just, so this is PowerPoint two, I'll just open up PowerPoint one and just slowly go through the slides. And if you have something that's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that, just let me know. Or if I see something interesting, I'll just I'll just talk about it for a little bit. So let me get that up. But if you do have like a specific question, please like stop me. So problem set one way back in January. Um, hopefully when you're like, when you're reviewing this, um, it's not that difficult because we look, because these are just the basic concepts and then we saw them applied. Um, so just review your classifications, right? What does it mean to be these? Uh, there's some questions to go with classifications. Uh, path pathways, that's what we're looking at. Redox reactions, biosynthesis, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you might want to review this. Uh, and this always redox, like oxidation numbers always, always confuses people, but hopefully it won't take you too long to remember that. And the, the like I said, you will have a couple math questions and it should be pretty obvious what those math questions should be based on the problem set, um, the, the extra problems I put up and for the math problems I have in here. Um, so just make sure you go about, you go back and like do these practice ones. Um, you should see something, nothing more difficult than these. In fact, you might see the exact same problems with different words and numbers, but this is the same way to, to solve it. Flux. I hope we all understand flux because uh, we've been talking about it a lot. So just, just review that slide if you didn't. Controlling flux, big idea. We talked about it in terms of PFK. Uh, so make sure you know the different levels of control that, that happens with flux as well. That's all there was to uh, PowerPoint one. Again, luckily, a lot of that is I've been hammering home, at least I, I hope I've been hammering home these concepts we talked in the first PowerPoint. So it, it shouldn't be that much to study from. Uh, PowerPoint two, uh, let me get in that. Again, more general stuff that hopefully we, we have a good understanding now going through more specific stuff. Uh, energy, yada, 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 different generic energy terms. Del the difference between delta G, not prime and delta G. Again, we should, if we understand the, uh, if we understand coupling and why coupling works, hopefully that uh, the, the idea between these two delta Gs, uh, you should know 
um, energy ATP, why ATP is so high energy. Um, heat, we talked about, I talked about that in video. Here it is, everyone's favorite. Why we can move phosphates around, uh, this group transfer potential. Basically, it's free to move something from high energy to lower energy. Um, and we see this in glycolysis. Uh, the thioester, NADH, that's also high energy. Reduction, uh, NADH to FAD. Uh, just make sure you know the, the differences between these. And we actually have a question that says this. So. And hey, look, it's a calculation. I wonder if I'm going to ask you this calculation. Probably. I will probably ask you a Nerd's equation question. Nerd's and delta G. We already just looked at this table today. That's all there is for bar point two. Three, we just went over. Three is glycolysis. Oops, that's the wrong file. Uh, so number four, I have way too much stuff open now. Um, so what happens to pyruvate? Humans go to lactate, uh, yeast can go to alcohol. What's the point of doing this? To remake NAD plus so we can rerun glycolysis. the difference between going to lactate and going to ethanol. Um, yeah, so just make sure you know if there's a difference and why there's a difference. Energy, blah, blah, blah. Another math is, this is like the same math we've seen already. This is Nernst's equation. Just another example, drive home in the, driving home the point that I, I kind of want you to know how to use the Nernst's equation. Flux, already seen this, already saw that, flux, 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 delta G. We saw this question in PowerPoint number two. Why are delta G and delta G not prime different? Um, make sure you know PFK is a major flux control. Make sure you know why it's a major flux control. Make sure you know how it changes based on what's around, how it changes with ATP and AMP. Um, make sure you know the big changes from T to R and PFK. Like what's the big difference? Big difference, these two amino acids. Arginine 162, glue 161. Everything else more or less stays the same, but this is the big change um, in this protein. Cycling, uh, forward and reverse reactions. How uh, we can control flux doing that. Yeah, so this, what's the advantage of pyruvate kinase with fructose 1,6 phosphate? And we talked about this. Uh, it's on the video if you want to go back. Um, this is kind of like a, a uh, another one of those concepts we're going to see in a bunch of different pathways, how products further down the line control um, reactions uh, further uh, up. Uh, at the beginning of the process. So um, if you don't remember this, if you didn't write it down, make sure you go back and just, just understand that concept. Uh, this is review. Make sure you can answer this question based on what I just said. And the different pathways of fructose, of lactose, and uh, mannose. So just know how if we eat different things, uh, we can go there. Um, so the, the most complicated one being uh, fructose. Um, so bypass PFK, that's a big point uh, for that. And just this little cycle. Again, what I'll probably do, I haven't made questions for this, but what I'll probably do is I'll probably show you a picture and just say what comes next or what came before it. I might give you a sugar and just say, okay, for fructose, where did this go? Or, yeah, that's, that's most likely what I'm going to do. I don't know. I haven't decided yet on fructose.
in that one. Then PowerPoint files. Um, more glycolysis questions. Again, great questions to test your understanding. Make sure you go back these without looking at your answers and looking at your notes. If you can answer these questions, like that, that will gauge your your level for taking the test. Right? You can do these questions. You know your stuff. Uh, I already talked about this before today, but make sure and, and another one of these pathways. I know it's a lot of pathways, but that's what metabolism is. Pathways on pathways on pathways. So pentose phosphate pathway, like what's the major products? Why do we run it? Those type of things. Again, all questions dealing with, do you understand pentose phosphate pathway? So go back and try to answer those. Why would we run it? What's the purpose? And then glycogen, um, and we talked about this extensively uh, the last like two days, today, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, so hopefully that's a little fresher in your mind. Um, so I'm not gonna go over like PowerPoint six again, but last call for any questions while you still have me as a group. Um, I will say, if you want to talk to me during, I probably will not be available Saturday and the beginning of Sunday. Happy Chinese New Year, every, everyone. Um, so I will be busy doing that stuff. But I should be able to answer emails. And if you want to have um, a talk via Zoom, you can probably do that on Sunday, Monday. Um, possibly Tuesday. If you have a group of people and you want to get me together, um, like on Monday, feel free to email me that. We can set that up as well. All right, but if there are no questions, I will let you free to let you worry, let you panic quietly. Um, what I will do, um, I'll probably do this Friday because I want to finish up like the rough draft of the test today. Um, I will put up instructions for ProctorU and then I will put up like an extra credit opportunity. If you show me that your computer is like all, all working before Thursday, like I'll, I'll tell you what to do. You just need to send me a screenshot. Um, then I'll give you a little bit of extra credit. Not much, but you know, better than nothing. All right then, um, since I'm not seeing anything on the chat, I wish you all good luck. It's a lot, I know, but I have faith in people. You made it this far in your scientific career. I have no doubt that my class, I have never failed anyone in biochem too, so don't worry. I have faith in all of you. With that, hope you all have a good weekend studying. Please do not hesitate to reach out. And our next live class will be on Thursday. So hopefully I will see you then.